six people went into the water, one little girl came out. The sharks took the rest. This is the No Fear Podcast. We know what scares you. I'm Matt. And I'm Mel. And this is the No Fear Cast, the podcast where we dissect horror and all the things that scare us. This is episode 23 of season 6, and we are stalking the waters of our series, The Summer of Sharks. And that's right, we all know Jaws, but this summer we've gone bigger, toothier, and downright absurd. We've had the weirdest shark horror movies right here all summer long. So far, we've faced the sharks of the corn and sharktopus, we've revisited Jaws and its sequel, and we've met the Meg. But this week... We are going to tackle probably the second most famous shark movie, Sharknado. Okay, so I am actually going to get us started off here. I'm going to give just a little bit of background info about Sharknado and then talk about my past experiences with this film, if I can call it uh, such. I just want to say, first off, I really do enjoy this movie. This is my third time watching it. So even if I'm mocking it, I'm mocking it all in good fun because that's how it was made. They made it knowing what they were doing. So basically, Sharknado was a movie that came out in 2013. It was on the Sci-Fi Channel, produced by Asylum, which I believe also did the multi-headed shark movies. I'm pretty sure. I know we talked about it in the episode, so... I know it's uh, my uh, it's coming out of my mind right now. I can't really remember, but I know we talked about it in at least one of our shark movie episodes. Sharknado, and I believe all the Sharknados, because it's a long string of movies now, um, was directed by Anthony C. Ferrante. It was written by Thunder Levin, and it was starring, I believe you have to say Ian, so Ian Zaring and Tara Reid, amongst others. And Sharknado was the first of a series of six American made-for-television science fiction action comedy horror disaster films that came on sci-fi between 2013 and 2018. And Matt, I think you were the one who found this information that his it has kind of expanded a bit into video games and comics, which I had absolutely no idea about. And then apparently there's also a spinoff film, which I haven't watched, uh, Sharknado Heart of Sharkness uh, from 2015, which is apparently a mockumentary about the quote unquote making of Sharknado. And then it actually really happens. So that is a little bit of background about the movie Sharknado, and I'm sure we may talk even more about some aspects of that background as we go through the movie to go into our discussion. Like I said, this is my third time watching it. It's on Prime, so listeners, if you've never seen Sharknado or you're interested in giving it a rewatch, it's easy to do if you have Prime. And the first time I watched it was when it debuted on Sci-Fi Channel. So I was aware of it, and I knew I probably was going to watch it, but I wasn't necessarily thinking I was going to watch it, like, right when it came out. And I remember a friend of mine said, hey, you know, I don't have um, a television or cable right now, and I really want to see Sharknado when it debuts. Can I come over to your house and we watch it together? And I was like, Sure. And so she came over and we watched it and we laughed and enjoyed ourselves uh, immensely because we both like bad or cheesy movies. And then I can't remember how long it was after it came out in 2013, Rift Tracks did um, Sharknado in theaters. And I, when I can, which I can't always because of where I live, um, being far away from theaters, but when I can, and there's a Rift Tracks in theaters, I go check it out. And so I went with my family to see Sharknado in the theater uh, made fun of by the Rift Tracks guys. And that was very enjoyable. I know I've seen the second movie and I think that might be all the Sharknado movies I've watched. I may have watched the third, but I definitely did not. I have not played the video games or read the comics or watched the mockumentary. And I definitely kind of fell off the Sharknado wagon at some point. I, part of me feels like with my love for bad movies that I should um, get back into it and try to get through all of them. Though I know there was one article that we looked at that was basically saying it was like kind of time for Sharknado to go away for a little while. So I don't know, maybe I don't want to ruin the joy that is the original Sharknado and even the second one. So I don't know. I'm I'm kind of on the, on the fence about whether I should uh, 
go through the whole series. Matt, have you, one, have you watched the whole series? And two, what, what has been your experience with Sharknado? Well, sadly, I have not watched the entire series. I have not seen all six movies. I also have not seen the spinoff, although I do think Heart of Sharkness might be up there amongst some of the great puns in the world. I, uh, yeah, I, I've seen the first Sharknado. I saw it, I don't think I saw the premiere of it on sci fi, but I did watch it not long after. I, it's, you know, been almost nine years since it came out. So I'll be honest, I don't fully remember, but I know I did watch it around the time that it came out in 2013. I just don't remember the exact timing of it. And uh, I, I was telling Mel before we started recording, I have actually not seen Sharknado since then. I, I have fond memories of it. I liked it then when I saw it. I, I definitely enjoyed it, but I, I haven't seen it since then. And like you, Mel, I'm I'm pretty sure I did watch the second one, and I did watch that one like when it aired on Sci-Fi. But I know I haven't seen anything past Sharknado one and two. And I kind of feel honestly the same way that you do about watching all six of them, because even when you're making deliberately bad movies, I mean, they, they, it has, it's a careful tightrope that one would have to walk to make it a good, bad movie. And some movies are so bad, they're good unintentionally. And then there are some like Sharknado, or I would say Snakes on a Plane, that are aware of what they were going into it. And so I, I don't know how I would feel about watching all six of them. So I, I know it would probably be a bad idea for me to watch all six of the movies like in one massive binge or over a weekend or something like that, just because I, I feel like if nothing else, even if all six were great, I would probably burn out pretty hard and pretty fast on them. So yeah, that's that's my basic original take on on sharknado I, I enjoyed it when i first saw it i just i haven't watched it since not for any reason then because well i guess i just have forgotten <laughs> to, to come back to it but i guess we should maybe sort of jump into some of the rest of the discussions of it mel would now be a good time for me to bring up the uh the search results that i uh discovered on google yes i <laughs> I really enjoyed that part of what you found. So, and I actually played around with it earlier today on Google and I was still getting, I was getting a couple of them. So yes. Yeah. Go ahead and share that. <laughs> All right. So listeners, you're, you obviously won't be able to see this, but for, for each of our episodes, we do have a shared Google doc where we'll post like links and various other things that we find in researching whatever topic we're doing for that particular episode and the other night i just did a search for sharknado because i was trying to get to i guess the wikipedia or the imdb page but i just kind of also wanted to see just what google would give me if i just searched sharknado and like most google results some of the first ones were the wikipedia and imdb link and uh, they, you know, they did the Google thing of of showing the main cast members and that sort of thing. But for those of you that are regular Google users, there's a section kind of below your search, like your first couple of search results, where they'll show related searches, and it'll say, you know, people also ask. So you know, similar searches to what you've searched. And so I took a screenshot and posted this into our shared doc here because I just. I started laughing like hysterically. So if you search Google for Sharknado, at least as of today, mid-August in 2022, the similar questions asked by other people about Sharknado. One, is Sharknado the highest grossing movie? Two, is Sharknado based on a true story? Three, is Sharknado appropriate for an 11 year old? And four, is Sharknado a good movie? And I find it quite interesting how 
uh, basically specific that third one is is it appropriate for an 11 year old not for a teenager not for uh a child but a 11 year old specifically <laughs> but also of course is sharknado based on a true story um i listeners i i, I should hope that we probably don't have to tell you this but if you were in doubt i'm fairly certain it's safe to say that sharknado is not based on a true story but uh mel <laughs> what were your thoughts on that uh s- <laughs> similar search results there <laughs> i i laughed so hard when i saw this in the doc i think i actually yes i did i actually wrote like lol in there um I figured you would see it. Yeah, I was playing around with it earlier today, and I got pretty much the same thing. One time I got Is Sharknado a Satire, which I wasn't sure what that was. Well, okay. And then there was another one that was like, where can I watch Sharknado 2022? Which I don't, I mean, I don't know if that means where can I watch it in 2022, or if it means like they think there's a movie Sharknado 2022. But based on a true story came up both times I did it. (laughs) that's that's the one that really like normally i don't i don't even pay attention to those like similar search results or i'll just kind of glance at them and i think i was just sort of like glancing over it as i was scrolling and i did a like double take i feel like if i'd been drinking something i may have done a legitimate spit take when i read is sharknado based on a true story because like i just sort of scanned over it and i paused and i reread it to make sure that that was what I had really read. And then I read it a third time just to be sure. <laughs> that, yeah, apparently enough people search for whether or not this is based on a true story that it is a very, very common Google search. And the 11 year old also popped up for me both times I did it. So, how many times are people asking about specifically 11 year old kids? Like, that just struck me as really off too. <laughs> Exactly. Like like I said, it's not asking for teenagers or like, you know, middle school age, like it's specifically 11 years old, not 12, not 10, 11 years old. I. It well, is kind of, oh, I was going to say that asking if it's a real story is kind of funny to a certain, just in general, but also when you think about the movie itself, because as I was watching it, the movie, it's, uh, I think we talked about this with the multi-headed shark thing, but that you have to throw some science at you. Uh, not if it, it doesn't have to be real, of course, but just something. And I thought it was funny, the different ways that they tried to give the audience something to hang on to. Cause we have no scientists. We're just following regular people. And like, at one point they just say, what was it? At, when it starts out as a hurricane, they're like, oh, this just must be global warming. And then they're like, oh, the hurricane which I don't know, that's a Pacific, so I don't know if it'd be a typhoon or not. But anyway, they're like, the hurricane is forcing the sharks north, kind of like a bird's, you know, the bird syndrome there, where you have that, you know, animals are being pushed in a different direction they typically go. And then later they do reference some sort of, um, I don't know if it's real or not, but it is something that does happen. They reference uh, storms pulling fish out of the water and like dropping them all over towns or whatever. So yeah, I thought it was interesting. When you think of Sharknado, it just seems so preposterous that they still tried to throw some gestures out there as to why this could be happening. And so when I saw that is Sharknado based on a true story, I was just like, wow, that's so funny. I wonder if people are asking that before or after they watch the movie. <laughs> I sure do hope that they're asking that before having not seen the movie, but <laughs> I don't, I don't know. Like you said, they, they, they did reference the, the, I, and I, I, it's a failing on my part. I did not research that side of things much at all, but that idea of storms picking up fish or frogs. And I think frogs is one of the examples I've heard of, at least as kind of a, a hearsay thing and dropping mm-hmm. them miles away from where they were originally i i don't know how much truth there is to that i I mean i believe it has been documented as happening but not not with such frequency to warrant this being the explanation if you will (laughs) i mean it, it it's more of a freak occurrence and um, I know that this is jumping way ahead, but when we get to the actual Sharknado part of the movie where there actually are tornadoes with sharks, 
you can see from some fair distance away the tornadoes and there are like hundreds of little sharks that are caught up in them and and clearly visible and yeah i just i i i think they they tried to science their way through it but like you said there really isn't much to to hang on to there i definitely don't think you could hang a hat on the uh, the plausibility <laughs> meter on this thing <laughs> I love the the fact that they went all in on it, though. I mean, they seriously, like, I turned on the movie, and it's been so long since I watched it, I really wasn't 100% sure how it started. I knew there was on a boat, and I knew one of the last kills was the dude in the actual tornado getting chewed on. I, I knew that, but I didn't know, I couldn't remember the very beginning. And the very beginning is literally just a water spout pulling sharks out of the ocean, and I was like, it knows what it is. <laughs> like, from the yes. very beginning <laughs> there's no explanation or anything it's just like yes we have a shark nato you know <laughs> unlike the kind of strange prologues we sometimes have with multi-headed sharks i mean this was all in from minute one it was shark nato a tornado of sharks <laughs> i will say though after that part there is kind of the non sequitur prologue that takes place on the the uh hunting ship or the the what do you call it um uh, poaching ship i guess you will where you've got the the ship captain and the the asian gentleman who's trying to pay him for shark fins and whatnot and they they mention that it's a pod of twenty thousand sharks so i guess that's how they're tying this together to to plant that seed in your mind that this is this massive pod of sharks that's how there's so many sharks because i mean I think we see 20,000 sharks in this movie, if I'm being quite honest. And all different kinds but, of sharks, too. Not just great whites. Right, right. There's tiger sharks and other, other some such sharks. But uh, but then it, it just sort of devolves into, like, the the sharks get blown onto the ship, and the one of the sh- one of the crew gets eaten, and then the the Asian man tries to make off with his money, even though they're in the middle of the ocean on a boat. So there's literally nowhere for him to run. And then he gets eaten by a shark, and then the opening credits. <laughs> it's like it, it, it felt almost like a well, we got about five more minutes we need to fill, and we got some exposition. Why don't we just add some more with that scene? Go back and, and reshoot and. <laughs> have a little bit more there <laughs> so yeah i agree with you that it may have come off kind of uh ham-handed but i my impression was that well one they needed to show the sharks getting pulled up in something out at sea and two the other thing i was thinking was since these guys were illegally getting shark fins and then tossing the dead bodies of the sharks overboard, that this was kind of like a revenge thing for the sharks that, you know, even though they're helpless and being thrown around the tornado, they're still getting to kill these people who have been uh, preying on them um, in a really kind of terrible way. So that, that was kind of how I, I interpreted it, but I agree with you that they probably could have like skipped that and gone to the sharks invading the beach scene. Well, I was fine with them including the boat scene up until the the man tried to to back out on his deal and keep his money and and run away with it because again it was rather nonsensical. <laughs> Where are you going to go? You're on a boat in the middle of the ocean. There I mean and there's obviously a storm that's blown up all around you. So <laughs> I think that was more the point that I was having issues with. I I agree with you about what you were saying that I mean, that's what they were doing to sort of establish the the sharks and showing them getting sucked up in the in the storm as well. I did make a note about it that <laughs> it is interesting the way these sharks act, and we see it from the very beginning on this one of the sharks that I, I believe it's the the Asian man, uh, the one that eats him. It flops onto the boat like it gets dropped onto it, and it bites his legs, and then it like slurps him up. <laughs> like and and I wrote this down like um the dogs from Lady and the Tramp eating spaghetti like that's what it, what it looked like rather than biting his legs off and just chomping it sucks him in and continues and it eats him whole uh, that way so uh and we see a lot more of that throughout the throughout the movie so um for those of you to go back to that Google search don't think it was based on a true story I don't think sharks can physically do that especially when they're out of water 
Yeah, I totally... <laughs> I totally agree with you that the way the sharks were eating these people was kind of funny. And yes, the way the guy trying to leave the boat and not able to was also just like, you know, kind of an eye roll from me. Yeah, I mean, throughout the movie, and I guess this is a problem you get when you have sharks in a, tor in a tornado. Like sometimes when the when things are being flooded, the sharks could maybe swim like they came out of drain pipes or they were coming up out of sewers or they were just washing across the freeway. And if they had any amount of water at all, even if it's probably not believable in, you know, in real life, they were able to swim around and kill people. Um, and there was some really wild stuff like when they go to try to rescue his ex-wife and daughter and the pool water gets into the house, but then none of the, the water like explodes out of the house as if there was no hole anywhere. But yeah, there's some implausible things, a lot of implausible things, but I feel like they probably ran up against the wall of like, if you have sharks flying around a tornado, they're going to have to be killing people in different ways than swimming. And so, yeah, you have them like slurping people down, which I think was a good way to describe that one. And like they would come and they'd fall on pavement or whatever. And then they would like, I don't know how long they could survive outside water, but they would just be like almost crawling, not crawling per se, but like moving around or propelling themselves around somehow by writhing and following people. And there were a few times where I was just like, the shark is not going that fast. Like you could just run really fast and get away, but they would have to like fall and do these dramatic shooting into the shark's face and hitting it with chairs and things like that. And then of course you have the dramatic kills of later in the movie where people like a shark flies through the air and eats them or a shark flies through the air and injures them because if you have a shark nato they're most likely going to be flying through the air and getting you or falling on you one of the things that i thought was interesting about the beginning is how long it took for people to realize there was a problem like some people are saying there's a storm and in their cuts it's stormy looking and there's huge waves and then other people are just chilling on the beach like I'm sure it was just you know b-roll or shots that they took of like a tranquil beach but the way they are cutting them together it was very confusing to me it's like now it's sunny now it's storming now it's sunny now it's storming and even though people are saying on the radio that this thing is awful and there's going to be this catastrophe and there's sharks like it takes the people a long time to one evacuate the beach and then two evacuate the pier area as well i feel like if a massive hurricane was headed toward me and there had just been a shark attack that i would have left sooner and i also love the moment when he kicks him out of the restaurant and he says everybody go home safe remember you know don't forget taco tuesday like that that cracked me up they're not nobody is acting like this is a disaster even though they're seeing pictures on tv and hearing things on the radio about crazy things happening and maybe that's how people would actually be but I feel like if the waves were as high as they were showing sometimes and the storm winds and clouds were like that I wouldn't just go to a restaurant right on the edge of the beach and chill out I would probably try to get somewhere else or to my home but yeah there would be these weird lulls where not much would be happening without much explanation and then all of a sudden all this action which you need as a movie you have to go up and down you can't be you know, at 60 the whole time. But yeah, sometimes it was almost like, I don't know, non sequiturs, because it's like, okay, how did we get from here to there? But the point is to watch the sharks flying through your killing people. So I guess you can't hold them too responsible for that. Well, I do agree with you. And also, I feel like they almost even went out of their way to make Tara Reed's character not believe that there was a problem or an issue. Like, Multiple times she tells Ian Zeering's character that, you know, we're, we're miles away from the beach. Um, there, it's barely even raining here. All of these different things. And, I mean, the only presumption I can make is that she's not actually watching the news because they never actually show her watching the news or listening to the radio. And so she thinks he's blowing things out of proportion. But... It could have been, I think, a little bit clearer because as it is, it felt like, like you said, kind of silly. Like, as he says, you live like six miles from the beach. And as someone who grew up in Louisiana, uh, six miles from the coast and there's a hurricane, you get gone <laughs> because that is 
it's not going to stop at the coast. It, it'll lose some steam, but it takes a little while to do that. And six miles is not going to cut it. So I don't know. I felt like I, I, I saw what they were trying to do because they had to establish the, the tension for him to get to her and his daughter and then also go rescue his son. But I, I guess they could have maybe made it a little bit clearer because it, it just came off a little muddled, I guess. But like you said, I, I, I'm not going to ding them too hard for it because one, they're not trying to make high art here uh, as evidenced by, well, everything about this movie, <laughs> but two, like you, like you said, I, I, I mean, the real, the real point is to watch the sharks and the tornado and the sharknado of, of sharks. <laughs> so, I mean, it, it, I, I, I guess they were just, like I said, establishing, establishing the drama for him so that, you know, when he leaves the restaurant that he runs, that he has a, a place to go and a mission to get on. And then of course they can encounter obstacles on the way there, which obviously they do. So yeah, uh, but I agree with you. It's, I mean, they're, 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 there's a lot of flaws <laughs> in this movie. Now, I'm not completely familiar with the area that they're in, which are, you know, they're talking about Beverly Hills and LA and Hollywood, but there, it did seem to be some destruction of what appeared to be landmarks. Um, and of course, the Hollywood sign is ripped off and becomes like these weird, like spinning saws of death and end up. <laughs> Uh, killing this one character, the uh, school bus driver, which is another, like if we're thinking this movie, like you said, is like, they have to get to certain places to rescue people. First the ex-wife and the daughter, then the son, um, then LA. Um, <laughs> the, one of the obstacles is they, you know, Finn, the main character, uh, he says he, he always helps others. And that was one of the reasons his marriage fell apart, apparently. And so anytime they see anyone who needs help, they stop and help them, sometimes to their detriment. Um, one of the things I really appreciated was, the again, the way this movie was so self-aware about itself. Um, when the shark falls on their car and literally bites the roof open on their car and is attacking them through the, the top of the car and they're all hitting on it and trying to shoot it and get rid of it. And they're, they're literally all screaming things like, this is crazy. How is this happening? And I really appreciated that because it was like the people in the movie also realized that what was going on was just completely beyond like all explanation. Um, <laughs> And there was there was no like heroic attempt to kill it. It was just like what is what is going on? Um and it reminded me of the the one part in one of the Shark to Puss movies that we were watching where one of the characters uh was being half heartedly threatened and they were basically just like, Get rid of me now, almost as if they didn't want to be in the movie. And so I kind of I enjoy it as a person who watches bad movies when they're self aware, so much so that they kind of start to not just be funny, but also start to make fun of themselves, like in the process, almost like a meta uh, layer. I definitely agree with that. <laughs> That's always a, a fun moment when, and, and in this one in, in particular, it's handled well. There, There's no like looking at the camera or winking or breaking the fourth wall so much as it is an honest reaction of this is crazy because sharks falling from the sky and a hurricane in LA resulting in tornadoes is, I mean, pretty crazy and ridiculous just in and of itself. So I, I, I like the fact that, like I said, that they, they didn't, there was, there was no nudge, nudge, wink, wink towards the audience so much as this felt in line with an actual reaction that somebody might be having. And you, you mentioned the uh, Finn, his, his, I don't want to call it a character flaw so much as his sole character trait, I guess, of helping others. And I kind of wanted to almost segue that into a, a note that I had written while watching this because I didn't quite see the point of this. Uh, but I mean, well, let me back up. Most of the characters are fairly two dimensional. They, they don't have a whole lot of motivation. Uh, Tara Reed's character is 
an ex-wife and so there's tension between the two of them because they're divorced and that's really it like it, it doesn't get explained much deeper than that than that they're divorced and i guess part of the divorce was because he helped other people too much but whatever uh before i i lose the thread here i i had made some notes because finn's employee nova the uh the barmaid i guess if you will uh, who who comes along with them um it's obvious from the very beginning that she's got a shark bite scar on her leg but she's extraordinarily cagey about it the, throughout the entire movie it's one of those things where okay i i get it if if people ask her questions about the scar and she says you know i i don't want to talk about that or or something like that but the way she is constantly cagey about it and changing the subject and also basically hiding or 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 avoiding her complete fear of sharks completely like i don't know it just it it felt a little weird to me and then that all led up to her big emotional moment which was actually uh what you read or well, i guess the end of it was what you read as the intro uh, about how her entire family was killed by sharks when she was young. I mean, I get what they were going for, but I guess I wish that they handled it a little bit differently because it just felt really weird to me. That, like, why why she was so cagey about the scar, you know? Like, why why she couldn't just say, I got attacked by a shark when I was younger. I don't want to talk about it anymore or something like that, you know, when asked about it instead of completely changing the subject or, or giving an obviously fake answer and like walking away. Well, what, what were your thoughts on that now? I agree with you from the very first moment we see it. We know that this had to have come from a shark because we're watching a shark attack movie. And yeah, she goes through all sorts of like, gyrations or gymnastic convolutions to not answer the question the whole movie it, there's when finn's son asks her about it and she finally tells him she's like she has shorts on which show the scar and yet she gets angry when he sees it which i thought was kind of strange i'm like if she i mean obviously she's traumatized by this and i was like but if she really didn't want to talk about the scar she would do a way better job of hiding it, I would think. So it was like the movie was always pushing it in our faces only to withdraw it. And the payoff when she finally tells a story is, I mean, this is a sad story, but the way the movie sets it up is like it's part of the comedy of it. Because one, the story that she tells and the part that I read was like a plagiarism of part of Jaws. And like th this where you get the phrase that they repeat throughout the movie i hate sharks no i really hate sharks you know now i hate sharks too so i guess there was the kind of comic payoff of it and it i guess gave her character a little bit more depth maybe but it i mean it's like the shallowest depth ever because we knew that it was something like that from the very beginning i wondered a little bit i mean I guess it had to be a father or grandfather who died. Like it had to be some sort of family situation to get the full like kind of pathos of it. But it was interesting to me that, that when the movie would try to pull on our emotions or complicate the story a little bit, it always like moved around these family themes, but then it didn't always flesh it out enough for it to seem as important as it was, I guess. So yeah, I, I felt almost teased too much by her story not being told. This isn't quite the same thing, but I was thinking about it while you were mentioning this kind of, I don't like this kind of ignoring something and then like exploding into almost like a non sequitur with the emotion. Like, why is she telling, she has not told anybody in the movie that she obviously has known for months and months, maybe even years, but she tells this guy she just met who's the son of her employer too. That was, I know it had to happen because of the movie, but yeah, the, the reveal didn't make a lot of sense, but there's also, I think it's actually around that same time or right before that, when Finn realizes that his daughter is like, sitting on the floor and I was like oh well she must be traumatized because they've seen some crazy terrible things and then she's actually kind of having a weird pouting depressed temper tantrum because she says that Finn has always cared more about the son than for her 
and she says, uh, you know, you're always there for Matt and never there for me. Um, and they have this weird conversation where the things that they're saying to each other don't quite match up or like, I don't understand where this is coming from in the past that she has this issue. And the thing that he says to try to make her feel better is always remember, I came to rescue you first. <laughs> and I was like, wow, this family has some real issues <laughs> because <laughs> you have the daughter who's like devastated, not because the apocalypse is happening, but because she thinks that, you know, there's a sibling rivalry here. And then the father quells it by saying, don't worry, I love you more. I... <laughs> It kind of this is like an inside joke kind of thing, Matt, but it reminded me a little bit of our discussions after we saw the movie Interstellar. It was like, um, how what is happening with this family here and these choices that are being made? And I felt like they were trying to complicate the movie, but it just kind of fell flat to me. It was something for them to be doing while they made bombs. <laughs> I agree. I agree. And yeah, I, I mean, I had a similar thought about Interstellar as well, and, and not to go too far into a discussion that none of our listeners would really understand, but Mel and I did go see the movie Interstellar in the theaters together. And afterwards, uh, we were talking about it. And I think we were both kind of, it, it, for those of you that have seen Interstellar, so much of it hinges on Matthew McConaughey's character's love for his daughter, almost at the expense of ignoring his other child. And that kind of feels very similar to what happened here, or at least the the gestures towards a sibling rivalry of sorts or, or, or something. Because, yeah, like, she's not traumatized, like you said, but is instead upset at her father because he always prioritizes her brother and yet his response like you said was well i came for you first well i mean one as as a observer of this movie she was closer so why would he drive all the way out to the desert to rescue his son and then drive back to rescue his ex-wife and daughter but two like what, what even is the point of that? Like, what is the what is the point of including any of that that comment or commentary between them? Because it it just doesn't it doesn't ring true, and it doesn't I don't know. It's 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 weird. <laughs> it was just weird. Is, is all I can really say about it. Um. So yes, total agreement there. Uh. It. I don't know. Well, since we've kind of made it towards the end of the movie, should we shift our attention towards the the climax itself where they are literally throwing bombs into tornadoes? <laughs> yeah, I think we need to talk about that end where we not only have helicopters, which we've seen in our shark movies several times, but we have people throwing bombs out of helicopters at tornadoes filled with sharks. I feel like that is the big payoff moment, right? Like that's what we've been waiting for when you watch this movie. <laughs> it is definitely the payoff moment. And, and I've, I've definitely found myself along for the ride, if you will. But I don't know. I just kept nagging at me. The the, the part of me that that just couldn't let go and just... Um, just enjoy the movie was definitely questioning the how is the helicopter flying because they didn't even fly over the tornado they kind of flew next to it and i mean tornadoes are not just static things that there's like one limit to and when you're you're right next to it you're fine especially when you're in something like a helicopter which is you know going to be affected by the winds from the tornado but Anyway, I, I, I guess I just have to let that sort of realism go because, like you said, they're in helicopters throwing bombs into tornadoes full of sharks. And I mean, that is, that's what something like Sharknado has to end with. And and not only that, but you you have the shark eating Nova as she falls out of the, the helicopter 
uh, only for the same shark to fall onto Finn while he's holding a chainsaw that he then uses to slice his way out of the, the shark and rescue Nova, because of course she wasn't dead. I guess it swallowed her whole instead of chewing her like every single person else in the movie. Yeah. It, it's just wacky over the top. I don't, I don't know what what's more extreme than over the top, because I don't feel like over the top covers how just, completely bonkers the ending is it is completely bonkers and we also have finn using this armored hummer that they stole from a movie set to send a bigger bomb than the ones that they're using out of the helicopter into one of the tornadoes and that's how he finally dissipates the worst of them so yeah i mean we've got helicopters with bombs people falling out of helicopters and getting swallowed whole and large armored vehicles with bombs an armored vehicle which the last time we saw it was covered in netting and had people's blood all over it yet it was perfectly brand new and fine and had nothing on it when finn took it but that's okay and then i just feel like after our discussion about family issues we have to we have to say that claudia for some reason the daughter was refusing to get was not listening to him when he told her to get away the shark so he sacrifices himself at the end to save the daughter that he loved more and ends up in the shark and then chainsaws his way out and pulls nova out and she survives so yes i mean you you can't get any more like you said it's over the top it's it's like a perfect end for sharknado it really was yeah, Matt, I I feel like we need to just end now. I mean, we've talked about all the explosions and we've talked about the chainsaw and we talked about the weird family dynamics that were going on in this movie. We got the heroes, or at least some of them survive. Um, and we know that they're going to come back for more um, episodes of Sharknado uh, Extreme Action, which we we may or may not watch. But I just have to say, listeners, I'm sure you've noticed by now, it was just Matt and me for this episode. Lisa wasn't able to join us, and I'm kind of sad that we didn't get to include her in this discussion. Matt, we're definitely going to have to get her feelings about her rewatch of a Sharknado at some point. But I feel like we've we've hit the end, and there's not much else we could say about this movie other than I think we both had a lot of fun watching it again. I would watch it again in the future. And who knows, maybe I will watch a couple more of the, the sequels. So with that, we're at No Fear Cast on Twitter and Instagram, and we have a Facebook page. Our email is nofearcast at gmail.com. So if you're enjoying our shark movies, if there's one that you really like we've talked about, or one that you like that we haven't talked about that you would like to tell us about, feel free to get in touch with us via email or social media. If you love what we're doing, consider supporting us on Patreon, uh, where you can get access to exclusive content. For $5 a month, you get access to exclusive mini episodes that we put on Patreon in between our main episodes. So we might talk about another crazy shark movie, or we might talk about a topic related to a movie or the book that we've talked about in the main episode. Or as we totally understand what the way things are right now, especially, um, if uh, supporting us on Patreon is not an option for you, please tell a family member, tell a friend that you think would enjoy this podcast, or you can rate and review us on your podcatcher of choice, which is entirely free and helps other listeners find us. Our theme music is by Nicholas Gasparini. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll be back in two weeks with a brand new episode.